Welcome to this second week of Lent where we are learning how to listen. Last week, we, we heard from this story of Moses and how he was out in the desert, or even as the author says, beyond the wilderness. And he was looking for something. He was searching for something. He was listening. And he found God in this holy ground around a burning bush. And we talked about having this posture of listening, which can be a revolutionary act in our modern world. And so this week, we turn our attention toward dialogue, towards these interactions of of one-to-one, person-to-person, of how we might learn how to listen. And our first topic that we're going to talk about in terms of dialoguing is recognizing our own biases. Now, I'm going to introduce a handful of biases to you. To you. I'm, I'm getting this information and this research, particularly from an author by the name of uh, Brian McLaren. And I'm going to have the information for where I got uh, this, uh, this research on biases. So if you look at this Facebook page, go visit that link. And I highly encourage you to check out his ebook on, on biases. And then also he did a podcast series in which he had um, some dialogue with a couple of other folks around all these different biases. Please dig in and do the work of, of learning how to recognize these biases. He recognized 13 different ones. And, and he had them all beginning with the letter C as a way to kind of help remember I'm only going to go over just uh, a handful of them, not all 13, but encourage you to go do the work to dig in a little bit more. So we're just going to cover a handful of these biases, and then I'm going to give you a practice to do uh, throughout, uh, throughout this week. The one thing I want to remember or emphasize when we're talking about these biases is that the bias itself is not necessarily bad. In fact, some of these biases come about for because of our own survival instinct. It's a part of our DNA. It's a part of who we are as human beings. And sometimes these biases can be very helpful. But we have this very negative connotation toward bias. Um, you, You know, we hear these phrases like biased media. Okay. So, one thing I would respond to that is, well, of course it's going to be biased. Every single one of us is biased. But then we have this other kind of view that, that maybe we, we think that like scientist or science is unbiased. We, we have this perception of objective truth without bias, as though the bias itself is a blemish. The thing about bias is it just is. There's not a designation of good or bad. It just is. Where it starts to be harmful is when we allow these biases to control what kind of information we let in and what, what, what we get out. When we allow these biases to control how we engage or relate to another person. When we let these biases sever a relationship or a connection with our neighbor that's when these biases turn harmful. And we need to be aware of the biases. So it's not so much remembering and memorizing what these biases I'm going to share are, but it's starting to recognize, oh, this is what bias does. This is why it's hard for me to hear my neighbor share new information with me. This is why it's so hard for me to even understand where my neighbor is coming from. And guess what? That goes on the flip side. They're thinking the exact same thing because you have your own biases that are getting in the way of them being able to understand where you're coming from. So what I hope to gain from this short exploration of biases is to begin to recognize, not to completely get rid of them because we're never going to get rid of our biases, but to be able to recognize when they're getting in the way, that way we can make the choice whether or not to go along with that bias, whether or not to say, you know what, this bias is leading me in a direction that's against my values, or this bias is leading me against 
truth and beauty, and we can shed that and venture outside of our biases so that we might learn to listen and to grow and that we might begin to interact compassionately with others. So let's dig into these biases. This first bias that we want to call our attention to is a confirmation bias. Another way we might sometimes hear this is an echo chamber. That means we're already predisposed to recognize and take in information that confirms what we already hold to be true. So this can actually be beneficial in some ways because we get some affirmation for, for what we hold, affirmations for, for what we believe, affirmations for the things that we value. And that can be a, a very helpful thing, but, but here's where it becomes unhelpful. And it's a very strong bias because if we're hearing something, if we're hearing another person say something that goes against what we already hold to be true, we're gonna immediately hold it at bay. We're gonna keep that out there because wait a minute, something doesn't seem to be right. But then whenever someone says what we already believe, it's just pile it in, pile it in. This is comfortable, it's comfortable for us. And so the danger lies in the comfort of that confirmation bias in because we become so com comfortable, we become complacent, and we never seek to grow or to learn new things, things that are pushing us beyond what we already know. So the confirmation bias, yes, it can sometimes be helpful, but the danger is it sucks us in to this echo chamber where we're only listening to the voices that already confirm what we already believe, and they're not pushing us to grow, to learn new things. The second bias is a complexity bias, meaning we are biased towards those things that seem simple. This is why we are drawn to bumper sticker statements, we're drawn to, to billboards, and where we reduce, let's say even something as, as big as a political platform or a theological paradigm, we reduce it all to a bumper sticker slogan that we can chant. That comes into us a lot easier than being, being presented with a complex truth or a complex idea. But here's the thing. Yes, that's helpful in our minds because our minds are hardwired to simplify things. The simpler they are, the easier it is to interact with the world around us. So there's the benefit, but here's the danger of this, of this complexity bias is that beauty is very rarely simple. The good things that we experience in life are very rarely simple. Your relationships that you value the most are very rarely simple. They are full of complexity. And when we let this bias take control, then we miss out on all of that truth and beauty that just can't be contained within a bumper sticker slogan. So the complexity bias, that's the challenge for us. Yes, maybe the bumper sticker helps us grasp some kind of truth, but we've always got to push against that and say, that's not the whole thing because truth is always much more complex than a bumper sticker. This third bias is a big one, community bias. Now this is something where in the very DNA of, of who we are as human beings is we are social creatures. Part of our own survival and health is dependent upon a community that we find ourselves in, a community that can give us identity and meaning and purpose and, and, and values and, and, and they can foster strength and goodness and camaraderie and helpfulness and compassion and love. All of these things are found in community, such a beautiful and wonderful thing. But here's this thing about community bias, right? It, it's this bias that, that holds a community together there's some kind of unifying factor to it. And so our bias to the community is indeed a very good thing 
It, it, it helps solidify who we are and who we belong to. But yet this community bias has a way of making those that are outside of our community the other, the evil one, and we push them out. And so what happens, let's say, in the context of a church, a very strong, tight-knit community, and then now all of a sudden someone comes in and says something that is different than what other people in the community are saying? What if they believe a different way? What if they act out a different way? And what happens? Well, that community bias is going to start pushing those people outside of their community because it sees it as a threat. It sees this other as a threat to the community. So the challenge to this community bias in recognizing it is starting to see why why am I pushing this person away? Why am I disagreeing with this person? Is it because of a legitimate reason or is it perhaps just because the community is feeling threatened? That it's being presented with new ideas, that it's present, being presented with, with, with a different idea of truth, a more expansive idea of truth, an opportunity to learn and grow. And if we recognize this community bias, instead of this other person being a threat to the community, actually we could see the other person being a way that the community can grow can grow in its love and compassion and expansiveness, can grow in its conceptions of truth and beauty. So community bias, such a strong one. Instead of using it to force people out, that's the tendency, but let's recognize it when that's happening and start to include so that the community can grow. This next bias, this is a big one. The conservative liberal bias. This is the one we find ourselves so stuck in, left wing, right wing, progressive, traditional, conservative, liberal. They're set up as these binaries. And this bias says that we lean one way or the other. It's a bias towards one way or the other. And this is some interesting research. Again, referencing uh, Brian McLaren and, and, and what he had been looking into. And the research says this, that, that those that typically lean left in their political stances value things such as fairness and kindness. And then those that would lean to the right in their political ideologies would value things such as, as purity loyalty, liberty, and authority. So those values in and of themselves, none of them are bad. They just are. They just are values. But what's interesting is when we start to view these biases that are biases towards, whether you have a bias towards the left or a bias towards the right, your bias then becomes a bias against. So if you have a bias towards fairness and kindness, the danger that we start to see is then you have a bias against things like purity or loyalty. Now, why would things such as this happen? You know, since the 2000s here, if you look at the popular votes in the presidential election, there's only been one time that the right-wing party of America, the Republican Party, has actually won the popular vote of the presidential election. That was the second term of George W. Bush. Otherwise, the left-leaning party, the Democrats, they're the ones who have won the popular vote. You look at, at institutions like church. Churches are things that on the surface value such things as purity and liberty and authority, loyalty, those institutions are in decline. Why is there such a pushback against those particular values? And the reason being is because 
we've seen so many times when these values of authority and loyalty and purity are used to undermine things like kindness and fairness. They're used in heavy-handed tactics to support systemic racism, or they're used to support things like misogyny and sexual harassment and abuse, and, and they're used to cover up even abuse. That you must cover these things up so that and, and, and you raise above the specter of loyalty to a particular institution. And so there's so much hurt that has been done because of that. So how do we move forward in this kind of a divide where you might have a bias towards something and it turns into a bias against something else, right? How, how do we move past that? And, and start to realize that maybe looking at the life of Jesus, you start to see that he completely redefines what purity is and where we focus on externals or maybe the moralities of, the pure, uh, of being pure, where Jesus starts to focus on the purity of your heart and in the compassion that you express. And when he talks about loyalty, it's no longer about loyalty to one person or another so that when you scratch their back, they're gonna scratch your back. But it's a loyalty to actually the poor and the disenfranchised. And maybe when he talks about authority, you're not finding authority in the typical power structures and those that wield their power, but yet authority is expressed through servanthood. And when you talk about liberty and freedom, it's not just a liberty to do whatever it is that you want to do, but it's a liberty to be who you are. And so you see Jesus redefining all of these values and you start to see that this bias one way or another, liberal to conservative, that when we start leaning and letting that bias take control of us, then we turn into a bias against when we're missing the whole point where maybe we could hold all of these values together. But we've got to be able to recognize that bias first and see what it's doing in us so that we can put the brakes on, that we can stop, that we can listen for what those values are and realize, you know what, I might hold those values too. Maybe I might redefine it a little bit differently in the way of Jesus, but... I hold some of those values too. And then we start getting a more expansive view of what our society and our political life could be. This next bias is called a contact bias, meaning we're going to be biased towards those that we're already close in contact with. This is really similar to a community bias, but, but you know, in, in reality, we sometimes move outside of our community and come in contact with other people and, and, and we create these different networks and maybe we've got multiple communities going on. And so contact is really about your personal connections. And so if all you are connected to are people that, that look like you, that believe like you, that that love other people like you, that behave like you, that vote like you, that's all feeding into that echo chamber, that confirmation bias, right? And, and, and your, your, your views and your ability to, to take in information and to learn and grow is going to be hampered because you're just going to be hearing these reflections, right? But yet, if you start connecting with other people that are different than you, that vote differently, that believe differently, that look differently, et cetera, that have, that have a different kind of job, that have a different kind of wealth status, that contact is going to allow you to expand in your ability to listen to other people and to even live in compassion with others. And so that bias is actually a good bias, right? Because we start reflecting and learning and, and, and growing as we connect with more people. But if, but we've got to realize that bias at hand. And so we start to think, 
huh, this person, they are just like me, aren't they? So when they're talking, it's really easy for me to listen. But perhaps when I'm talking to someone else that, that is in a different tax bracket or that it comes from a different kind of neighborhood that, 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 that has a different kind of life experience, one that's experienced systemic racism, maybe it becomes a little bit more difficult at first to listen and to hear, but the more you're in contact with that person, the more you're able to listen and to live compassionately with someone who is different than you. So that contact bias becomes actually a way for us to grow in our connections. This last bias that we're going to talk about is, is called a cash bias, money, right? Such a powerful influence over our lives. And it's such a powerful way that it, it, it controls even how we come to believe things or how we come to, to think different ways, how we come to vote particular ways. Money is a very powerful thing. If we are presented with a particular truth, if we are presented with a particular value, if we're presented with an ethic that is telling us to go out and change our way of life, and that starts touching our pocketbook, we are very, very hesitant to go through with it, to make that change. We protect that pocketbook. We protect that money. So cash bias, we have to be aware of what our money is doing. You see, money, in some ways it is what it is. It's not good, it's not bad, but yet it's that attachment to the money that is no longer morally neutral. That attachment to it has a morality behind it. There's a phrase that often gets put uh, out there, especially in political seasons when they're drafting a budget and, and they say the budget is a moral document. It's not just numbers and figures. Budgets speak to what our morals are. Budgets speak to what our values are, not only at the national level, at the state level, at political levels, but even just your own personal budget. Looking at your budget, what does it say about what you value? And when something is presented to you to start maybe changing your lifestyle and it comes up against your, your pocketbook and it's going to make a change to what your budget is, recognize that tension. Recognize that tension. And then once you're able to recognize it, then you can say, oh, I'm being more attached to the cash in my wallet than I am being attached to showing compassion for another human being. You've got to recognize that bias that comes into play. So we covered a handful of biases. Again, this is, this is from the work of Brian McLaren. Take a look in the Facebook post for links to, to where you can get access to his work and to dig in, in deeper with this. This was just a handful, right? But it's to get us to start thinking about how these biases begin to affect and, and in a way put up walls around us that prevent us from being able to listen to others to be able to learn and grow, to become better humans, to live compassionately with others. You see, as I've been saying, it, the biases just are. They're neither good nor bad, but, but once we start recognizing, we can see them, we can see then, how is this bias starting to take control of my life? When it does that, that's when the harm starts coming in. And so it's not the bias itself, but it's that letting it take control. So the first step becomes us recognizing the bias so that we can keep it at bay. We can let it be there. We can acknowledge it and say, yes, I am a human. Yes, I have a bias to my community. Yes, I love my community. 
Yes, I have a bias towards my money because it provides the food on my table and it provides the shelter for my family. And yes, I have a bias towards those that I'm in close contact with because I love those relationships. And so we recognize the bias, but then we start to say, wait a minute, is this starting to get in my way? Is this starting to prevent me from being able to listen? Is it preventing me from living with compassion towards another person? That's the movement we want to move along. So, so practices this week. Last week I introduced um, two practices of finding 15 minutes of stillness and finding a sit spot somewhere out in nature where you can just watch the change of the season and begin noticing around you. I want you to continue those practices. Those are so foundational in learning to listen, learning to notice. This week, I want you to add to this practice a way of starting to investigate what are our own biases at play. And and I think a good way to do this is to, to take a look at a news headline, something that's hitting the news. Maybe even take something that is political in nature. We've got plenty of political news, right? So grab a headline and I want you to notice what are your initial reactions and then just write those initial reactions down. Now this is before reading the article, just the headline. What's your initial reactions? Is it one of support? Is it one of of pushing it away? Is it one of hatred and anger? Is it one of excitement? What's your initial reactions to it? And then start investigating. What are these biases at play, right? In the worksheet, I I give a link um, to our worksheet in this Facebook post. If you open that up, it'll list this practice, but also it's gonna to list out these biases that we've talked about. And I want you to go through and maybe see what biases are at play in my reactions to this. And then you can make the third step of being able to say, are there some biases I could maybe kind of push to the side and, or even like push through so that I might learn and understand something else, that I might learn and understand where someone else is coming from? to be able to listen. So that, that's the idea, right? Find, find a headline, write down what are your initial reactions to it. Begin looking at what are the, the biases at play in you to that headline, and then start, start thinking through which biases can I push through? Which ones can I, can I let go of? Thank you for, for joining me this week. And next week, we're going to continue learning how to dialogue, and we're going to talk about uh, this method of, of mindful communication. Mindful communication, being fully present when we are are speaking and dialoguing with one another. I look forward to seeing you next week. Grace and peace.